Well, as you know, we are continuing with our study in the book of Colossians, and this morning we'll be looking together at verses 19 to 23 of chapter 1. If you want to turn there in your Bibles. Uh, Last week in verses 15 to 18, we were introduced to the theme of Christ's supremacy, a theme that along with the sufficiency of Christ are the two main themes we find weaved throughout this book of Colossians. And in answer to the question, in what ways is Christ supreme, we were reminded last week that Christ is the visible expression of the invisible God, verse 15, that he is supreme authority over all creation, verses 15 and 16, that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth, verse 16 and 17, that he is holding the entire universe together, verse 17, and that he is the origin and head of the church. In verse 18, and the conclusion to these truths that present Christ clearly as Lord of all creation and Lord of the church leave us with no other appropriate response than what we see in verse 18, that Christ should be given first place or preeminence in our lives, in the church and in everything. So as we come to verses 19 to 23 this morning, we focus on the redemptive work of of Christ, specifically the powerful transaction that has taken place at the cross and the hope this gives us. And as with all we've looked at so far in this book, these words were penned by Paul in response to and in correction of the growing false teaching that threatened the Colossian church, the form of Gnosticism that elevated man-centered philosophical knowledge and sought to undermine both the humanity and the deity of Christ. As we'll see this morning, it is the fact of both Christ's deity and his humanity that makes redemption possible. If either was lacking in Christ, we would have no hope whatsoever. But because Christ is both God and man, we do have hope, an eternal hope. And so the title of the message today is The Power and hope of the gospel. I'll just read verses 19 to 23, and then we'll pray and have a look at them together. Verses 19 to 23. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's pray. Father, we are here now to hear your word. We ask, Lord, that you would give us willing hearts to receive. You give us the understanding, the illumination of your Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And Lord, this is a time where we engage with the living Christ through the word of God, and we pray, Lord, that we would, we would have that sense, that active, not passive stance towards this time, Lord, where we are eager and keen to hear you speak to us and to respond to that with faith and obedience in the strength that you provide. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as mentioned just before, in verses 15 to 18, we saw the supremacy of Christ, the theme introduced, that he was the image of the invisible God, the visible representation of the unseen God, the exact replication of God contained in a human body. The false teachers who Paul was confronting here saw Jesus as important, but not as the one true God. It doesn't matter how flattering a person is about Jesus, 
how great they think he is, to think of him as anything less than God is the utter blasphemy, the ultimate blasphemy. So the Gnostics saw Jesus as a spirit being, but they couldn't conceive of him taking residence in a physical body because, again, to them, all matter was evil. So Paul makes his slam dunk case of Christ's supremacy in verses 15 to 18, and then he refers back to this and summarizes it in the first few words of verse 19, where he says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. God the Father was pleased for all his fullness to dwell in Christ. And remember, as we understand the Trinity, it's not that God the Father shaved some of his God qualities off and gave them to Christ, or that his power and attributes were diminished in any way when he gave of his fullness. Rather, it was God's good pleasure that all of his divine power and attributes would take residence in the person of Christ. Remember, the Father is fully God. Christ is fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully God. But there is only one God existing in three persons. The Father is God, but the Father is not the Son or the Holy Spirit. The Son is God, but he is not the Father or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, but he is not the Father or the Son. It's simple, isn't it? The word pleased here in verse 19 can also carry the meaning of resolved, as in a resolution was made. It pleased the Father, or you could say, the Father resolved, he was pleased to resolve that all of the fullness of God would dwell in Christ, who is the Him spoken of in the middle of the verse. The word fullness speaks of God's completeness. The totality of of all who God is. And the Gnostics likely use this word to mean the sum of all divine attributes. But their philosophy was this sum of all the divine attributes that represent God was shared out among the multitude of eons and emanations, different spirit beings. But what Paul tells us here is that Christ himself was the possessor of all God's fullness. And all this took place at the incarnation when God became man through the person of Jesus Christ when he was born of a virgin named Mary. And as the song that we'll often hear at this time of year so beautifully says, Mary, did you know that when you kissed your little baby, you kissed the face of God? So it pleased the Father that in Christ all the fullness of God dwelt, but it didn't please the Gnostics to hear this. And the concept of God's fullness being in Christ is repeated in chapter 2 of Colossians 2, verse 9, where it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see the same phrase. So this was a point that Paul really wanted to drive home. Because Christ is God, because Christ is Lord of all creation and Lord of the church, he is therefore universally supreme and sovereign over all things. So in Christ we see God revealed fully and completely, but Christ did not come to this earth only to reveal God to us. Christ came to this earth to do his Father's will which was to display the incredible and indescribable mercy, grace, and love of God by becoming the saviour of the world. The Lamb of God who would take away our sins by dying on the cross in our place, taking our full punishment, rising from the dead, and defeating sin and death and securing our forgiveness and eternal life. In Mark 10.45 it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He was on a mission. That was his mission, his redemptive work, based on decisions that were made between the Godhead way before this world ever came into being. As Ephesians 1.4 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It's just incredible to, to ponder that truth. Before the world was even created, the redemptive work of Christ that we experience and enjoy today was conceived among the Godhead. And so, in summarising the main truth that we see here, which will go along with the outlines if you have one, we could say this. In verse 19, in Christ dwells all all of the fullness of God's power and attributes. In Christ dwells all of the fullness of God's power and attributes. If this wasn't true, nothing else we read about next would be possible. If this wasn't true, you and I would have no hope whatsoever. But it is true. And I've had conversations with people where they think it's maybe okay that there's some other person they're talking to, professes to be a Christian, and they say, well, you know, they love God, and they, they have some funny ideas about Jesus. They don't believe he's actually God, but they, 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 you know, they're really neat, and they're really committed, and they read. It doesn't matter. There's no option. He is God. And children, here's the first point for you on your sheets this morning. Jesus was born on earth so that God could become one of us. I know you're thinking, I thought it was so we could get presents. No, no. That might happen as well. But he was born on earth so God could become one of us. Jesus was both fully human and fully God. You get that, kids? Fully human, fully God. And this is called the incarnation. That's the name, the incarnation. It's incredible. It's one of those truths that I... I'm very fond of and always feel like I could sit there on a rock looking out in the ocean for eight hours straight and just ponder the incarnation and I wouldn't come back saying, well, yeah, that's, I'm pretty much got it all sorted in my head now. I'd still be going, there's just so much more to ponder. Let's continue on with verse 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now here we are introduced to this work of reconciliation that Christ has accomplished, both in relation to the creation, as we'll see, and in relation to our salvation as believers. Now to be reconciled, we understand, means that two parties come together who were previously at odds with one another, or enemies of one another. In the case of biblical reconciliation, relating to God, only one party is at fault, and it's not God. And this is also a verse that some have interpreted incorrectly, trying to build a case for universalism. Now you can see why they might do that, taking this verse in isolation. Universalism is the belief that when all is said and done, everyone will ultimately be saved, all humans and all angels. That sounds good. It's a very easy message to tell everyone, isn't it? We'd love you to come to Christ, but if you don't, hey, it's fine. He'll let you in anyway at the end. So I might as well just carry on living my life and then get, yeah, well, I guess you probably could. Now, apart from the fact that such an idea undermines the need to ever share the gospel with anyone, I mean, if this were true, why go and share the gospel? There's other things we could do with our time. But as we compare scripture with scripture, we can quickly dismiss such an idea by reading a couple of things. For example, what it says in chapter 2, verse 15 of Colossians, speaking of Christ's sacrifice, it says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So the question, who would Christ be triumphing over if these angels ended up being saved? There's no real triumph then, is there? 
And we have Peter in 2 Peter 3, 7 saying, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. It wouldn't make sense to read that and say judgment and perdition of ungodly men who at some point will all be saved again anyway and everything will be fine. This sounds like a bad ending for those ungodly men to me. And if you want some more proof, listen to what Jude says and tell me if this sounds like universal salvation. Jude 1, 12 and 13. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. In verse 15, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they've committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Again, if you carried on saying, but all of those ungodly people from whom there is judgment perdition will eventually be saved and with Christ for all eternity. Would not make sense. So I think scripturally, just on those few comments, verses, we are on safe ground to reject the notion of universalism. It just seems like one of those distortions that is come about because of a difficulty to accept the reality of eternity in hell. But that's not a basis to change the word of God. Now, if you look again at verse 20 of Colossians 1, we'll see what Paul is saying. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So there is a reconciliation that takes place that we generally refer to relating to salvation. We'll see that in the next verse. But there's also a reconciliation on a broader scale, not so much in relation to salvation, but in relation to creation restoration. And this is what Paul is referring to here. The ultimate reconciliation of creation through its restoration at the end of time. We read of this in Romans 8, 19 to 21. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's talking about a, a liberation, a restoration of creation itself. Creation was subject to the consequence of the fall also, which is why as Christians we say we live in a fallen world. We live in an incredibly beautiful fallen world, but it's a fallen world. But one day God will make all things new. He will restore all of creation to a perfect state. In Ephesians chapter 1 we see another mention of this creation restoration. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. This is anathema to the Gnostics. All of heaven and earth gathered together in Christ, the ultimate goal of redemption. And looking at Colossians 1.20 again, as we mentioned last week, notice how Paul is deliberately using language that shows Christ's connection to the spiritual and the physical, to the tangible and the non-tangible, specifically undermining the heresy that was being proclaimed. And notice it says that Christ will reconcile all things to himself, not all men. It includes those for whom he died. But it says all things. Now this refers to the both the millennial reign of Christ upon the earth and also the new heavens and the new earth that we read about in Revelation 21, 1, where John writes, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. Sorry, surfers. Sorry, boaties. I think you'll have a good compensation now, in the next part of verse 20, 
we're reminded that there'll only be peace in the world because God himself has brought about this restoration through the death of Christ. He says, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So there's, there's a link here with the crucifixion of Christ and a creation restoration. That's not to be taken to the extreme of some Christian environmentalism message instead of the gospel. And there will only be peace between man and God when man responds to God's offer of salvation also made available through the cross that we'll see in the next two verses. So just in consideration of the truth presented here in verse 20, we'll summarize it this way. Because of the death of Christ upon the cross, all of creation will one day experience a restoration. The new heavens and the new earth. Because of the death of Christ upon the cross, all of creation will one day experience a restoration, the new heavens and the new earth. Now, it's important for us to realize that this full restoration is, of course, a yet future event. Just look around, that's pretty obvious. We do not experience the full benefits of this yet, but as we'll see shortly, the benefits of reconciliation regarding our salvation can be experienced in part as long as we come to God by faith. And again, contrary to the Gnostic beliefs, Christ didn't need any help. This creation restoration was done by him and for him. He took care of it all. Children, here's your second point this morning. This world is not how God intended it to be because of the wrong things people have done. And we call that sin, children. When people do wrong things against God's laws, but one day... Jesus will make the world perfect again. One day. The world is not how God intended it to be because of the wrong things people have done. Sin. But one day Jesus will make the world perfect again. Let's continue on and read verses 21 and 22. It says, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works Yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So what we read here is just incredible. The contrast between what we were in our previous state before Christ saved us to what we are since Christ saved us is staggering, isn't it? Again, we see the term reconciliation used here, this time referring to salvation made possible through the death of Christ, referred to as the body of his flesh through death. And again, the focus on the human attributes of Christ, his blood, his flesh, concepts the Gnostics could not get their heads around because that was evil matter. And as we look at these verses, we consider the power of the gospel. Look at the words here that refer to our previous state. Now, Paul is obviously directing the words to the Colossians, but they apply to us also. He says, you who once were alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled. Before Christ saved us, we certainly were alienated from God, weren't we? To say the least. And this speaks of a permanent state of alienation or separation from God's presence. It means to be shut out from one's fellowship and intimacy. But we didn't want this anyway before we came to Christ. No one does. Why would we want to be close to a God whom in our minds we consider ourselves to be an enemy of. And that's the next thing that Paul says here, that we were enemies of Christ. This reminds us there's no neutral ground when it comes to Christ. We are either children of God or children of the devil. In other words, enemies of God. There's no in-between kind of just nice person stage. And when it says enemies in your mind, it speaks of the attitude that we have towards God as an unregenerate sinner. Our mind wants nothing of God's rule or reign in our lives. Our mind wants no higher authority to defer to. We have our own thoughts, our own ways, and we know 
where that leads. Proverbs 14, 12 reminds us, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You can have someone who seems like a very nice person, but in their mind they are hostile towards God. They don't want his rule. In a pre-conversion state, man's mind is hostile towards God, and a sinful mind will lead to sinful conduct. As Paul mentions next when he says, by wicked works. And again, we mustn't misunderstand this and say, but what about the people who seem to be like seemingly decent people? They're not going doing wicked works, they're not going around killing people or robbing banks. Well, wicked works does not mean blatantly evil or sinful works all the time. It may seem that at a human level as good works or noble works. But if by those works a person expects to gain favour with God, those noble good works are essentially evil, wicked works. Now we see this in Genesis with the story of Cain and Abel. John says something about this in 1 John 3, 11 to 12. He says, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother, and why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Now what's important to note here is that Cain's evil works, according to external appearances, did not look evil at all. He put a load of time and effort into bringing the Lord a beautiful offering of fruit. If somebody brought to your door this Christmas what Cain put together for God, you wouldn't say, how evil and wicked of you. You'd go, Oh, that's so sweet. Look at that beautiful, that's wonderful. But this was not what God had asked him to do. The only offering that was acceptable was an offering of blood. So it's an affront to God. Forget the blood, check out this fruit. Put a lot of time into it. All God wanted was the offering of blood to cover sin because Cain came to God in his own merits. His works were considered to be evil, wicked, and they were rejected by God. And so this gives us a sobering reminder then of our previous state before Christ saved us. We were alienated from God. We were enemies of God in our minds. We were workers of wickedness. If we left it there, it'd be pretty miserable. But praise God, the next words after that are, yet now he has reconciled. God initiated the process of reconciliation. But again, he wasn't the one who needed to be reconciled. It was us that went astray, not him. Now, just to say as well, in mentioning Christ's blood in verse 20 and here his flesh in verse 21, this doesn't mean we are saved by his literal blood or flesh. That's where you get some of the strange ideas that have come through the Catholic Church. It speaks symbolically of the atoning sacrifice that was made when Christ shed his blood. That's the extent that Christ's blood relates to our salvation. He, in humanity, died. His blood was poured. His flesh died, was given sacrificially. And this ties back to the Old Testament and the sacrifice of the unblemished lamb at the Passover, a shadow of that which was to come through the death of Christ. And remember, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament was in place to cover Sin, but only in Christ, the perfect unblemished Lamb of God, could sin actually be taken away. There was a big difference. Cover sin, cover sin, sacrifice, sacrifice. Christ, the Lamb of God, take away sin, no more sin to be covered. Hebrews 10, 1 to 4, the author says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of these things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. You can't make someone perfect through these sacrifices. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers once purified would have no more conscious of sins, consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, because it was just covered. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Then what did John the Baptist say of Jesus? In John 1.29 it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away 
the sin of the world. See the dramatic difference there, the dramatic contrast. There's no hope of just getting past this continuous, continuous sacrifice covering sin until the Lamb of God comes and says, I'm going to take it away forever. That is the only reason we can have peace with God because God initiated the making of his peace with us through the reconciliation by sending Christ to take our punishment. It cost us nothing, it cost him everything. So let's remember as we talk about peace this Christmas, that the peace that we experienced, the peace of God, was peace that came through the blood of his cross, in the body of his flesh, through death. Now I love how the book of Ephesians, maybe you've noticed this already, but it parallels so much of what we read in Colossians. There's so many similar passages and vice versa. So listen to these same truths said in a slightly different way in Ephesians 2, 11 to 16. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near, how? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus make him peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby put into death the enmity. So what are the fruits of this reconciliation then? We'll read the rest of verse 22. It says, to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Wow, what a contrast. This speaks of our current and our future state in Christ. We have been reconciled. It's a done deal. It says in verse 21, he has reconciled. This is linked theologically to what we know as our justification, our legal standing before God because of Christ. But there is a future sense in which we'll fully realize and experience this reconciliation. John speaks of this in 1 John 3, 1 to 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. That's what we are children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. That's just an incredible moment to consider, isn't it? See Christ as he is and to be like him and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You want a motivation to live a pure life? Here's one. If you're a child of God, one day you'll stand before Christ face to face. That is your hope. It's not to scare you into walking in purity. It's to motivate you to desire to walk in purity. So what we are already positionally speaking, we are gradually becoming, practically speaking, through the process known as progressive sanctification. We've talked about that recently, the work of the Holy Spirit to make us more and more like Christ. And we see that because of what God has done in the past through Christ, we have the assurance that one day we'll be presented faultless before him on the day we stand before Christ. Again, how will we be presented to God. On that final day when you stand before God, when you are presented before God, how are you going to be presented? Let me tell you how. Firstly, holy. This means to be separated from sin and set apart to God. In Christ, God sees us as holy as he sees his own son. We are holy now. We are becoming more holy and we will be presented as completely holy before him, set apart. 
we will be presented blameless. This means without blemish, our character will become completely blameless in the sight of God because we're made spotless by the Lamb of God who is without blemish. Positionally, you are that now. You're becoming that more practically, but you will be presented blameless. And thirdly, I love this, above reproach in his sight. This speaks of the fact that in Christ, no one can rightfully bring a charge against us. We are unaccusable in his sight. Just consider that for a moment. You will be presented before the holy God of all the universe, almighty God, and you'll be utterly unaccusable. Not a thing that can be said against you because you are in Christ and above reproach in his sight. This echoes what John writes in 1 John 2, 1 to 2, where he says, my little children, these things I write to you so you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He's taking care of our sin. Sin will not come up when we stand before him. So in summary of what we see in verses 21 and 22, we'll say this. Because of the death of Christ upon the cross, alienated, wicked, enemies of God can be transformed into holy, blameless children of God who are above reproach in his sight. Isn't that incredible? Because of the death of Christ upon the cross, alienated, wicked enemies of God can be transformed into holy, blameless children of God who are above reproach in his sight. That's powerful, that's hopeful. And if we look at the contrast again, I'll put it up for you in a, a visual form that I think helps to really drive this point home. We consider our previous state before Christ and our current and future state after Christ. Look at the contrast. Alienated from God, enemies in your mind, wicked works. But because of Christ, because of the blood of his cross and the death of his body, we are holy, blameless and above reproach in his sight. So even just what we've looked at so far, considering, reflecting on these truths, can we just see how much power and hope there is in the gospel? That in Christ dwells all the fullness of God's power and attributes, that because of the death of Christ upon the cross, all of creation will one day experience a restoration, the new heavens and the new earth. And because of the death of Christ upon the cross, alienated, wicked enemies of God can be transformed into holy, blameless children of God who are above reproach in his sight. Listen to how this same truth is summarized in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we can bring to others. That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As you think about verse 21 there, that incredible truth, he was made sin for us. That very truth should motivate us that as Christians, even when we come into this Christmas season, as Christians, we do not just go through this time like everybody else. But we have the opportunity to go through this time 
as ambassadors for Christ, as though God was pleading through us. Pleading through us to be reconciled to God. Children, here's your third point this morning. When Jesus died upon the cross, he made it possible for us to be forgiven and to become God's children instead of God's enemies. That's what this word reconciliation means, children. You may have heard me say. We're no longer his enemies, but because of Jesus dying on the cross, we can be forgiven and made God's children, God's friends. Okay, verse 23 then, it says, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now the word if there, as we understand it in English, could give us the impression that this is a condition for our reconciliation. When in some ways it is, and in some ways it isn't. Paul has laid out for us the incredible transformative work of reconciliation, transformative work, that Christ has accomplished. And we've seen how, although this has been done, we do not see the complete and ultimate effect of this yet, do we? The reconciliation of man to God does not just happen because Christ died on the cross. We cannot see the ultimate effects in the future. God can. We cannot be certain of the future, but in Christ we can. What is clear here in verse 23 is that the benefits available to us now can only be experienced or realized by faith. That's the key to experiencing, beginning to experience this reconciliation. So in a sense, there is a condition but it doesn't mean it's a work or that it's salvation by works. So you, you don't really want to see this as a condition of salvation as much as a description of salvation. How do we benefit from these things? By faith. I'm describing how you benefit. And this work of salvation in our lives is secure because it depends upon Christ. But, and try to hear this, the God who ordains the end, our full and complete salvation, also ordains the means, our walk of faith, our trust in Christ. So Paul says the evidence, if you like, of one who has been transformed, what seals the deal, what reveals true reconciliation as someone who's been changed from an alienated, wicked enemy of God to a holy, blameless, and above reproach child of God will be a degree of perseverance and stability in their walk. That is what he's saying here. If there is no perseverance or stability whatsoever, there is no reason to believe there is any reconciliation that has been experienced. Look at verse 23 again. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded, and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. These are the means by which a person lives out their faith. As Paul says in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And I believe that all of us here Understand that enough to know that it means not work for, but work out. Work out what God has already worked in, for it is God who works in you. And in the chapter prior to this in Philippians, Paul had already assured the believers of this work, continuing in them and through them to the end. When he said in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who's begun a good work in you, he who works in you, will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. So because he will continue to work in you, let that salvation work out with fear and trembling. And then in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, that faith which allows us to persevere is a gift given to help us walk in works that he preordained. 
Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should work, walk in them. God has set it in place. He's called you to works. He's given you what you need to persevere and be stable so we can live that way. What does it mean then to continue in the faith? Back in verse 23, where well, this speaks of growth and change over time. And if you think about it, you can see why it was important for Paul to clarify these things, because if he didn't, it could give the wrong impression that Christ has done all the work, he's reconciled the world, he's reconciled all things to himself, there's nothing left for us to do apart from just reap the benefits, regardless of how we live. But that's not a true response to the gospel. Gospel truth changes lives, period. You do not say that you've been transformed by the gospel by a mere profession that you've been transformed by the gospel. If there's nothing to indicate transformation, it's a gradual change, it's a progressive change, but there will be a change. In addition to change in a person's life who's been reconciled to God, there'll be a stability that is evident. And Paul describes this here by the word grounded. This speaks of a person who rests upon a solid foundation and it's a reminder to us of the importance of discipleship, of new believers growing in their understanding of doctrine, as us as parents raising up our children with the understanding of doctrine, the basic teachings of Scripture that will give them a good foundation to build upon. With a good foundation, as Jesus spoke of in his parable of the wise and foolish man building the house on the rock and the sand, there comes the ability to remain steadfast. The next word Paul uses. Even in times of great trial and the storms that life brings. It makes sense, doesn't it? You know the people you've seen who the storms of life and the trials have crumpled them. I guarantee you would not save that person. They had a super solid foundation. They might have gone to church. They might have said they're a Christian. The house will get battered and knocked around and may have a wall missing. But it's not going to get wiped out if it's on a solid foundation. When a person is grounded and steadfast then, it is far more likely there'll be a person who is not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now this doesn't mean we won't have seasons of doubt or being shaken a little or a lot in our faith. It happens to all of us. What it means is we will persevere through those times. We will get up again by the grace of God. We will seek the help and the support that we need to stay focused on the Lord. We will not just be gone over here, never to return. We may be moved, but we won't be moved away from the hope of the gospel. There's a difference. What is the hope of the gospel? Well, you can peek down at verse 27 of chapter 1. Christ is in you the hope of glory. You may move a little from Christ, but you won't move away from Christ if you indeed have been reconciled to Christ. He's done all the work that needs to be done. He requires we take an active, not a passive approach to working out that salvation, not to gain his favour, but in response to his favour. And we also see here in verse 23 how it gives further proof that Paul is not teaching or advocating some kind of universalism because why would he give such a strong exhortation to work out that salvation and persevere in that salvation? How could he mean in a few verses up, everyone will be saved, you don't need to do anything, and then say, if you continue. So to summarise these truths that we've seen in verse 23, we'll say this. Because of the power and hope of the gospel, we can persevere in our faith and have stability in our relationship with God. The gospel is powerful. There is hope. We can persevere in our faith. We can be stable. Okay, let's just finish off in verse 23 where Paul says, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now this reference to the gospel being preached to every creature is in reference to the scope of the gospel it doesn't mean creatures, it means people. 
meaning that it had been taken to most of the known world at that time, the Roman Empire in essence. It isn't to be understood that every single person who existed on the planet without exception had heard the gospel. That's not the way this is written, but a reference to the many types of people all throughout the known world who'd heard the gospel. And lastly, Paul speaks of his calling to gospel ministry. The word minister meaning servant, which was exactly how Paul lived. A devoted, a dedicated servant of the gospel. Though he suffered for doing this. It wasn't just a job, it was a holy calling. It wasn't Paul's idea but God's. But Paul was happy to obey and be entrusted with his stewardship. Children, here's your fourth point this morning and your last one. Sometimes it is difficult to follow Jesus. But God promises to help us if we trust him and put him first in our lives. Kids, it will be difficult at times. Your parents will tell you that. But God will help you if you trust him. So, whether Paul was paid or not paid, accepted or rejected, he was going to preach the gospel in season and out of season. Now, in, whoops, in verses 24 to 29, Paul was going to expand upon his calling as a servant of the gospel, speaking of his devotion to do all he could to help people know and grow in Christ. So, in conclusion then, in these verses that we've looked at this morning, we've been reminded of what we were before we came to Christ, when we were without Christ, and what we are and what we will be because of Christ. I hope that you believe to the core of your being that the gospel message is a message of incredible power and a message of incredible hope. Many have not experienced this powerful transformation. transformation. Many do not have this hope. May we share that with others. So we'll have communion shortly. Um, just to say next week, again, we'll be having this uh, Christmas service I really want to encourage you, if you can, to bring any unsaved friends or family that you know will only ever come at Christmas. They will hear the gospel. Jason's going to be bringing a, a presentation of the gospel following a, a shorter message, shorter message that I'll bring next week. And then we will actually be picking up again in Colossians at the end of January. We'll be taking a short break over the summer as we have some People away, and I really want us, as many of us as possible, to track as we go through this, this incredible epistle. So let's pray together and we'll come to the Lord's table. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the incredible truth of this reconciliation that we can celebrate. And Lord, whilst many at this time of year will celebrate something that can seem so shallow, we thank you that. Every time we hear people talking about Christmas, it can be a reminder to us of the reality of this incredible reconciliation, of the powerful transformation, of the hope that we've received. And may we be vessels through which that hope and that transformation can come to others. In Jesus' name, amen.